Good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I, I'm not sure. Um, let me grab that just for a second, Brad. Thank you. You're the man. You're the man. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, it's a good day. It's a great day in the house of the Lord. It's a great Sunday. I, I guess almost um, as I'm here, I know many of you are here. You know, we, it's almost, um, it shouldn't be anticlimactic, but this Sunday, I feel like I've got to get revved up again because uh, we've, a lot of you and myself, and especially some of y'all have been working so hard, boy, we've just been through a week, a great week of vacation Bible school, and man, that's a lot of, it takes a lot out of you. Um, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of emotion, um, it takes a lot of physical, uh, a physical ability and strength out of us, and uh, I know we've just got a great group. It got back from Peru, and uh, you, we've been on those highs, and, and, and now we're not on a low, but it's like, gosh, we've got to get restarted and kickstarted again. I know there's things going on in our lives, and, and, and stress is up, and we don't know which way to turn, and, but I'm glad you've chosen, I guess is what I'm saying, to, to be here on a Sunday morning, to remember that, um, that it's God who restores us and refreshes us and that even in the midst of very busy, busy lives and a lot of stuff going on, you know, we can find some answers here. Sometimes we're in the midst of it. We don't think so, but God can refresh us. I know there's, <clears throat> we need to remember some, some folk in prayer, um, especially Steve Curtis, uh, Steve and Shay, talk to Shay. He's, he, uh, he's back at VCU and um, um, having some tough test results that have come in, but he's trying to get through some pain there. And um, I know Shay and Steve both just said to let you let y'all know about it, to be praying for him and lifting him up. And I know many of y'all are going through some things. I know that uh, I know Russ's dad still in, in Tennessee, good, struggling. Is Russ still up in uh, down in Tennessee or over across and down? I got to get my map straight. But we are you know, lifting him up, too. I know Bo is in the hospital, Wendy's husband. So let's be uh, <clears throat> praying for the body <clears throat> as, we, um, as we gather today, too. <clears throat> well, the gospel story from Mark is from Mark chapter 6, <clears throat> and it's a very familiar story. And <clears throat> let me begin before I, I, I read that, or we read that together. I'll ask you a question, and you'll know what the story is about immediately. Have you ever been asked to, to prepare 5,000 meals for I mean, 5,000 plates for one meal? Okay, all right, I have. Okay, and um, I've <clears throat> I've done it. I've had to do it several times and prepare for it with disaster relief. Now, not all of our disaster relief responses do we have to be preparing 5,000 meals, let's say, for lunch. But sometimes we have in really large disasters. And um, I know to prepare 5,000 meals, we have uh, prepared and trained for months and months and months. Um, we designed and, and built and bought about a $75,000, $80,000 kitchen and added a truck to it to be able to do that. We, uh, when we have that to prepare that many meals, we probably need at least 35 people on the site um, to have it ready for, to go out to lunch, to serve it on the line, and to take it out in Red Cross vehicles. We probably start getting up around 4.30 or 5 in the morning, getting things ready, and then we start cooking and packing, and I mean, 35 people are going as hard as they can and maybe by about 11 o'clock, we have 5,000 meals ready of like an 8-ounce entree, 6-ounce vegetable, maybe some bread and um, some snacks and some fruit. That's what goes out for that meal. And we have made 5,000 meals. But it takes a, a small village, plus we've got tractor trailer tra uh, trailers on the lot with... Uh, refrigerated food and, and dry boxes with canned food. We've got, we've got to set up this little village to support the volunteers. All of that to make 5,000 meals. 
in the story today from Jesus' life, he does it on the spur of the moment with five loaves of bread and two fish. That sets up the miracle, doesn't it? That is amazing in itself because I know what it takes to feed that many people. And that's just the men that were there, not counting the women and the children. Here's how the narrative goes from Mark chapter 6, and I'll begin with verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did, they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them, all the people, to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men <clears throat> who had eaten was 5,000. Wow. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, just in case anybody ever asks you in biblical trivia, it's the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four Gospels. The only one. Others, you know, they're in some, they're not in some. So it must have made a lasting impression on the minds of the disciples. They saw all the miracles of Jesus. But what made this one so special that they all write it down, they all remember it, and it makes it into every account of Jesus' life that becomes Holy Scripture. Well, I believe that, that it's stuck in their minds, not only because of the greatness of the miracle, but the penetrating message that was seen through it. Now, when I sit back and, and I recall great things and memorable, memorable experience that I've encountered, especially uh, that God has done in my life and that I've seen God do, I can think of several, but there are some that just stay in my mind. Events through my life that, that I look back on and they have shaped me as a Christian. They've moved me. And I can think back like that to those memorable experiences. Or things that I've witnessed in my Christian journey that have just changed me forever. They've made me stronger or they revealed Jesus in a way where I had never seen him in that way before. Or maybe they were experiences that, that turned the, the light bulb on inside my head and, and I discovered an answer to a question I had long been seeking after. Those are the kind of memories that stay with us. Those are the kind of spiritual experiences that never leave 
And evidently, this is the kind of experiences that the disciples had on the day when Jesus fed the 5,000. So we learned some essential truths for our walk. Not only did they learn them, as they share them with us, we learn them too. We learn, we're going to learn that there's a true rhythm to the Christian life. We're going to learn to, to see um, how we as sheep would be without a shepherd. And we will see that that little is very much in the hands of Jesus. I think the story points out that, first of all, like we said, there's a rhythm and there needs to be a rhythm to our Christian life. Verses 30 and 31 said the apostles gathered with Jesus. They reported to him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. You remember last week if you were here or if you don't, just read in Mark 6 what's just happened. The 12 disciples had just returned from their missionary journey. They had just returned from Jesus sending them out two by two to the towns and villages, and they had had a wonderful experience, a spiritual high. They had seen lives change. They had seen people healed. They had seen people actually listen to the Bible stories, to the gospel message that Jesus was preaching, and respond to it. That's a high when we share and we minister in Christ's name. I said earlier, um, I think many here at Fairview, we've just experienced the same thing, haven't we, in the past week or two weeks. Some have been on a literal mission trip. You've been to Peru, and, and you've seen how eager those children are to learn and to soak in everything you want to share with them. You've seen how meaningful it is when they see people that care for them come and do a few simple chores and share a simple message of gospel love. We've been through vacation Bible school and we've seen how naturally children love the stories of Jesus. How they gravitate to it, how they love to hear it, how, how uh, you know, they respond to it and how, how much fun they have when our world tells us that, gosh, you know, church is boring and church doesn't, isn't it fun for anymore? Yet we see the kids having a great time singing about Jesus, doing crafts about Jesus, hearing the stories and having fun recreation that's connected to what we're learning and eating snacks, of course. So these disciples had had a high, but, but you know, like many of us, they had been working hard. They had been ministering day and night, and, and uh, maybe they... Who knows, they had been doing stuff in the day and having to do stuff they had left uh, off their plate at night to catch up. And Jesus looks at them and he realizes that here they are coming off this high, this high ministry work, and he knows they're exhausted. They're exhausted physically, they're exhausted mentally, they're exhausted spiritually, and they needed replenishment. They needed time to rest. It reminds me that there is this ever-flowing rhythm of the Christian life. We continually go into the presence of God. We continually try to work for God and do what He wants us to do and, and give of ourselves and give of our time. But then sometimes we're immediately, maybe we work at Bible school in the day and the afternoon we're thrown right back. We have, we have to run to our job. <laughs> maybe we have to run back and face a family crisis. Uh, we go to Peru and we get back and our list is that long. We tried to whittle it down before we went, but man, by the, you know, the time we're away doing missions, it's grown. And boy, it's just exhausting to look at it. And so how do we come off our spiritual highs and grow and, and not come all the way down and maintain at least a little bit up here so we can continue to do great things for God? I remember when I would go and participate or lead a conference at Eagle Irie. And man, I was there surrounded with hundreds of other people 
singing praises and worshiping, and it was such a great experience. And, and it wouldn't take long till I got back, and I said, oh, man, I'm back in the real world now. And so I think it's important for the Christian life to stay in balance. Um, we, we become, when we become out of balance, we can become frustrated. Um, and if our balance is, is not right, we can become despondent. We can become depressed. We can even become lazy. And there's a couple of dangers in that cycle. And they're opposite ends. And one of the dangers is, is just being too, having too constant an activity. No one can work without rest. No one can live the Christian life without replenishing times alone with God, can they? There needs to be times of renewal for the Christian worker. There needs to be time of renewal for you who work so hard. And I look around and see how hard you guys work in the Lord's church at Fairview. You can be the most dedicated worker in your community, the most faithful volunteer in your church, but if you're not saving time for that quality time with the Lord, you will eventually become unproductive because you'll just wear out. And Jesus tells us, he, he lets us know through our body and through our spirit and through the spirit within us, just as he did his disciples. Guys, ladies, gentlemen, it's time to go rest a while, to spend some time alone just in communion with God and be replenished. So some of us maybe today here need to slow down a little bit, just enough to listen we have to have patience enough to wait upon the Lord. We, we need to give God time to recharge us with spiritual energy. And how can we do that without taking some time out each day and be quiet before the Lord and just let him minister to us? Jesus had to do it in the wilderness after those great temptations. Just take some time for the angels to come and minister to him, to get him ready for the next step. So there's a danger of just being so active. Um, there was a book, I never read it. It was just a great title on the bookshelves years ago, on a Christian bookshelves. It was titled Toxic Faith. <laughs> I should have read it. It's a great title, isn't it? About people that, that just uh, go, 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 go for their faith, thinking they're doing great things, but they never take time to take care of themselves. Now, the opposite end of that is there's the danger of too much withdrawal as well, isn't it? There's the other danger of this rhythm of the Christian life is when a person spends all of their time devotionally with the Lord but never comes out of their prayer closet to serve the world. Personal devotion with God without action, it's not true devotion. Endless, ceaseless prayer without work, is really not prayer. The rhythm of the Christian life is learning to draw away and receive power from God and then going back into the world to be involved with the lost and the hurting people that God commands us to minister to. So really, being exhausted and tired we're always doesn't let us off the hook. We need to replenish but just replenishing all the time and never working never gets anything done in God's kingdom. A healthy rhythm is what Jesus teaches us in this narrative, in this miracle. The second thing he teaches us is, is he teaches us that just what we would be as sheep without a shepherd they just bark from the boat. They go across. They're trying to find a place to retreat, but they don't. Verse 34 says, after disembarking, he saw a great multitude. He felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. At this great event that stayed with the disciples, they remembered what Jesus said about people 
and how they were without the Lord in their life. I imagine they often thought about what it would be like not to have Jesus shepherding them after his resurrection. Can you imagine what it would be in your life without having the great shepherd? Sheep without a shepherd just really can never find their way, can they? If we had to journey alone in this world, we would just get lost in life. Because we come to too many crossroads in our journey. We come to too many times and we have to decide so many important, huge, changing moments, events in our lives. But fortunately, we have a shepherd. And Jesus is there to help us in the crossroads of life, to shepherd us with gentle nudgings in which way to go. Sheep without a shepherd will never find enough food to eat. In this tumultuous life, we need strength for the journey. When we're discouraged or at our wit's end, we need inspiration. We need something or someone that helps us rise above ourselves. And when we seek answers anywhere but the food from God's Word and the food from Jesus' teachings... Those of us that are believers, we know our minds will remain unsatisfied, our hearts remain discouraged, and our souls remain unfed. To be fed and no longer be hungry, to get answers and and feel strengthened and renewed, that's only when we go to the bread of life. And Jesus feeding the 5,000 reminds us that Jesus is the bread of life. Sheep without a shepherd have no defense from the danger around them. Jesus defends us from many things, against the temptations of Satan, from from the evil forces in this world, from all of the arrows of the evil one that are shot at us. We need the good shepherd guiding us in life, and it's like the words of one of the hymns we sing or used to sing, without him how lost I would be. The feeding of the 5,000 reminds us of that, that we too, whether it's in our soul, our spirit, or physically, we find ourselves in a deserted place with nowhere else to get anything else to eat and nourished. We have Jesus who can take five loaves and two fish and sustain us. And thirdly, we learn that little is much in the hands of Jesus, don't we? Jesus says, I can, I can handle this with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And he divides everybody up, you know, so in such an organized manner, hundreds and fifties. And everybody is, takes the bread and the fish and everybody is fed. And we as Christians and we as church... Um, just need to remember from that. I think one thing we can remember is the immediate attitude and the the immediate response of the two different people uh, in this story. The disciples see the crowd. They see the hurting people. They see the needing people. They see the hungry people. And what do they want to do? We can't help them. Let's send them away to find food on their own. There's no solution, they say. It's discouraging, they say. We can, uh, and we have the church, we can say the same thing. Church is hard these days. <laughs> Convincing people that people need Jesus is difficult these days. Sharing the gospel's difficult these days. But we can't just send the people away. We can't let the multitudes drift into a world without Jesus. We somehow need to see and see the crowds and see the multitudes and see our neighborhood the same way Jesus did. Jesus sees the hungry crowd and he wants to get involved with them. He wants to interact with them. He wants to do something about it. He wants to meet their needs. 
he asked, how many loaves do you have? And, and Jesus gets the response, five loaves and two fish. And, and he says to the disciples, that's enough. Do you remember what his first words were? We talked about it the first day. I was here three years ago when he was calling disciples and, and his uh, response to the disciples. And then the disciples shared it with others. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see what Jesus can offer. Here Jesus says something similar, doesn't he? Look there, uh, I think it's in verse 38. How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. Go and see. For those that have come and seen and have accepted Christ, Jesus then says, go and see. Jesus gives us the resources to minister to those that don't know him. He gives us the resources to minister to those that are hurting, to those that are unsaved. And maybe if we are hurting, he gives us the resources. He says to them, five loaves of bread and two fish is enough. Two faithful disciples is enough. The people I've put in your church with the the gift of evangelism and outreach is enough. Go. Go and see if it's enough. He just asks us to bring what we have to him and let him bless it and let him use it for his glory. We don't multiply his church. Jesus does. Look at the Apostle Paul. He certainly did not bring the perfect lifestyle and the perfect tools to spread the message of Christ around the world. His handicaps were many. It's said that he had a very unimpressive presence. He was very unattractive. He had no public speaking skills. He he admittedly walked around with a thorn in his flesh, but he brought what he had to Christ and put it in his hands, and the Lord blessed what gifts he had. And so Jesus asked each of us individually even though we've just got back from Peru, even though we've just got finished with VBS, even though many things in our life are going crazy right now, how many loaves do you still have? How many fish do you still have? Go and see what I can do with that. Because the miracle basically tells us Jesus is the bread of life. He continually gives himself to us And sometimes we think that there will never be enough of Christ for our own battered and torn up and starving lives. When I'm going through Jesus, you don't have enough bread and fish for me. But Jesus just keeps on giving and he keeps on multiplying. And his love keeps flowing and we keep seeing his grace abound more and more in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And no matter what season we go through, Jesus is still Lord. Jesus is resurrected. Jesus has conquered death. And it's going to be okay. The contemporary Christian group, one of the ones I used to listen to in college, were the Imperials. And they used to sing a song. And part of their song was was about giving. And it said, giving. Jesus keeps giving and giving. Giving to our lives overflow. Giving, now I have a reason for living. Because Jesus keeps giving and giving. Giving to our lives overflow. Maybe you're exhausted. Maybe you're down. Maybe you're wondering what to do next. And I stand here and I know, gosh, there's so much now. Bible school is just like over. We're turning a chapter from summer heading to the church here in the fall, and my list is like this, (laughs) what you and I need to do. (laughs) Maybe your list is like that in your life, in your church life, but Jesus is the bread of life, and he has the resources to nourish you and to get you through what you're going through and revive your soul and spirit so you're ready to go and see once again. It can happen. We're going to pray and we're going to sing a, a, a final song. But 
Um, I want you to take the word of Christ with you this week. And, and um, if you need some rest, get some rest. <laughs> you know, if you, if you need some rest in your soul, spend, find some time alone. Um, if you need to seek and search what Christ is asking you to do now or wants you to do in the new, near future, do that. But just cling to Jesus, the bread of life this week in your life. And, uh, and be nourished with his bread and his fish and what he's done for you. It may sound daunting right now with what you're heading through, but I, I just believe with all my heart Jesus can do it. Nothing I can say may do it, but Jesus will have some words for you. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to an end of a day when we've worshipped you, maybe we do come here just tired, exhausted, stressed out, but Lord, we pray that through you reminding us of this miracle that everybody remembered, you gave it to us for a reason. That no matter how exhausted or, or um, how low we might be or how hungry our spirit needs and how much we need to be fed, Lord, you can sustain us. Be our bread of life. Just uh, fill us and encourage us this day. We pray in your name. Amen.